and um, they took a lot of time and money to, to, to join us here today. When, when Carolyn asked me to put together a panel, I told her, well, we'll be lucky to get two or three. And we, li we literally got all nine of them. I, I was shocked. It was because they want to engage with y'all. So y'all, you know, please engage with them. And let's, uh, let's start out by letting the engagement be all about a, a Q&A here. So, uh, Gordon, I think that microphone got shut off. Okay. I, I, it keeps shutting itself off. Uh, it could be the batteries. Batteries. Yeah, let's go ahead and put some fresh batteries back. Yeah. Um, so let's just let's start out, and uh, if, if someone will ask a question, I'll repeat it, and you can feel free to direct it to a particular river keeper, or um, I can handle it if you're if you don't remember people's names. So anybody? If you don't have any questions, we'll do icebreakers instead. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. you might want to come up with some questions. Yeah, you might want to come up with some questions because we can run our mouths. So the question is, where would the money come from? Well, surprisingly, that's not the first time I've heard that question. <laughs> <laughs> so there are uh, several different opportunities where uh, federal and state can write grants with nonprofits. I think there's a couple people who brought it up, uh, so we can sort of do some uh, brainstorming on that. Altamira Raha Riverkeeper, as most of our riverkeepers, we have a certain amount of sampling money in our budget, uh, specifically for things that are high priority uh, topics. And as you might imagine, coal ash for me is one of our high priority topics. So it's really a matter of sort of sitting down and figuring out the ways. But there's there's definitely ways out there. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes, sir. Yes, some of the uh, projects that we've tried to engage in with Habitat. Uh, similar to those on the Savannah, some of them on the Savannah. Um, one of the other talks, she mentioned something about that there was three impediments, typical impediments to getting some of these habitat restoration activities done. I think I could add to one, of, one more of that, and it's, it's the conservationists coming with one voice. You mentioned a minute ago the muscles possibly precluding um, filling in some of these areas, you know, I guess I'd, I'd like to hear y'all's opinion on how we can obtain the greater good of the resource and still sacrifice smaller units of that resource. That, what's the best way of dealing with that? I'm going to rephrase that a little bit. How, what, what's our role in helping herd the other conservation groups so that we can get to a, a solution to a particular problem? Because yeah. typically the Harper and everybody else has one voice. They know what they want done. And it seems as though many segments of you know the conservation group often have very different voices and sometimes conflict pretty heavily with one another. Okay, I'm gonna flip that to Laura and then Tanya. Laura, have you um, worked with other conservation groups along the coast that have either been helpful or an impediment? I'm not asking you to throw anybody under the bus, but just uh, talk Unless about that a little bit. Unless you want to. <laughs> sure, um, I think Gordon wants to throw someone under the under the bus on this one, but I will say that there is a very vocal um, conservationist, one individual, who opposed um, the solution to the noise cut problem that I presented about. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that we didn't get action earlier on, and then the project was deauthorized. Um, so it was still, that was before I was around as Tiller Riverkeeper, but that was one issue. He was speaking from a conservationist point of view, from an environmental <coughs> place, um, but it, it was it was not in line with our goals. Uh, on the flip side of that, we have had support from very many conservation organizations on the coast 
in regards to this uh, project, in addition to you know the greater support from the Georgia Water Coalition, um, and to solve that issue, it was a, a lot of conversations, dialogue, um, sitting down one on one and saying, well, here's here's the science behind it, here's what we understand, um, here's what the models say, here's what we predict, here, let's talk about your issues, and you know, and so um, we have gotten over that hurdle, but it, it's definitely a real issue, and my best guess would be to, the more you can talk about it, hopefully the better. <laughs> I have a question. What was the concern? Oh, I want to know what the concern was. Um, it had, the concern had to do with modifying a system. So in order to solve this issue, we're gonna to have to put in rock closure, or enclosures, um, halting the flow of the tide in certain places. Um, and so that's largely what the concern was. Don't, don't mess with it anymore, was the concern. Tanya, um, similar experiences, different with, with other conservation groups. Um, so the, the super secret team, I think is the answer. Um, it sounds silly and it, it's, it's always been kind of silly, but the idea is that everybody needs to sit down and have a conversation along the way. I think that's when, when people's feelings get hurt when they get left out. Now, in terms of the different conservation groups, I would say the only big conflict that I've seen emerge so far has been there's only a certain pot of money. Does that go into land conservation or restoration? And I think that's kind of an overall question that needs to be answered that I think is, is playing out. Um, in terms of the muscles that I mentioned, I think as, as long as those folks have a seat at the table at the beginning so we can understand, all right, there is a migratory way and they do move, right? So is there a way that, that we can relocate them back to the swamps where they probably were to begin with since this is still water habitat? Um, but I really think that the key is just constant conversation and, and often like bush beer. Um, so seriously, just sitting down, cheap beer. cheap beer, in the middle of the summer, leaning on the back of a pickup truck. Um, just having conversation after conversation and making sure that people understand what the end goal is. Nobody, nobody has the exact same lined up goals. And I always tell people, you know, it's fine. You can view whatever you want and I'll view the way that I want, but let's just get this one thing done. Let's do that one thing together. Thank you, Tanya. Jen has something she'd like to add. So it's interesting, river keepers have, are uniquely positioned, I would say, that we have to work with so many varieties of people that we're actually pretty well trained on it. We spend a lot of time working with our local fishermen, working with our legislators, working with our communities. And what we are all fighting for is fishable, swimmable, drinkable waters. So waters in Georgia belong to everybody, and we truly have to walk that walk. So we talk with everybody. It doesn't matter if you're humble or noble, if you're liberal or conservative. So I think that we are pretty well poised to help work with other conservation groups, as well as a lot of what you would consider non-traditional stakeholders. It's something that we do in our everyday work all of the time. So uh, we'd love to be able to work with you in, in, in helping facilitate that. Okay. Thanks, Jim. John? I'm happy to say I've not really encountered any large problem organizations in Georgia. Um, there is the occasional, let's say in some other state, example of a, an organization with board members and contributions from the kinds of organizations that we're actually opposing. Um, it does happen. It's relatively rare. Uh, for this uh, George EPD sewage bill report, I was really gratified by how many different organizations of a wide variety, and also we had a petition for individuals, how many of them pulled together to make this thing happen. Thanks. Great question. Thank you for that. Um, next question. Dr. Cecil. So if you, if you guys as conservationists have sort of a discordant voice and you have a partner on the other side that is governmental, uh, is there some sort of hierarchy as to who the government listens to or do you all have to work that out among yourselves before you approach whoever your federal partner is? So how do we solve our family fights internally <laughs> before we go talk to the government? Yes. <laughs> it's like most family fights. <laughs> 
sometimes it's not real pleasant internally, but we try very, very hard within the Water Coalition and within the Riverkeeper organizations to, to not show a, a divided front. Um, I, I, will, I will say from about 30 years of different sorts of political experience, both working for an agency, being in a regulated business, where EPD regulated my activities, and then being an environmental advocate, um, that the other side, you know, the people that um, that are against your agenda or whose agenda you're against, um, a, a very effective tactic is to find divisions within the group and then exploit them. And uh, if they're smart, they'll do it by any means necessary. Sometimes it's a well-placed check. Sometimes it can be um, the right conversation um, at the Capitol or after church. Um, I mean, it's done by a lot of different methods, but um, everybody I work with in this group of people and the people that preceded them um, and in the Georgia Water Coalition, we're, we're real sensitive to being divided. Um, not, yeah. And that's another key. Uh, Tanya, you go ahead and, and say that. We're also pretty territorial. So I work on the Savannah River, which means that's my watershed, right? So Damon's next door on the Ogeechee. Now, it's not right for me to step foot in his watershed without referring to him and asking, does he want my help? So that really kind of delineates our, our areas. Now, we cross that line quite a bit because of the expertise that, that different people have, but it's, it's pretty uncouth for you to show up in somebody's watershed without telling them you're coming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll give you a couple of examples on that. Coal ash is a great example yeah. of that because coal ash issues are all over Georgia, and we have <laughs> specific problems that, that crop up in particular watersheds. Right now, I'm thinking of a landfill that's in the Ogeechee watershed near Savannah, a landfill that's on the edge of the Okefenokee Swamp in your watershed. We have statewide interest in those issues, but we're very careful to coordinate with the people that are working in those local communities. Great question. John. Speaking of the coal ash, thing working? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, the water keepers have territories, unfortunately or fortunately, those don't match with state house districts. So, for example, the same guy who has the Chester Island landfill in his Georgia house district also has uh, South Lowndes County, which is the county I live in. So, I'll be talking to him about coal ash also because there's a landfill in Lowndes County that has coal ash. Whereas other water keepers may be talking to him about Chester Island or other things in between. So, yeah, we try to coordinate, but there are cases where we're all talking to the same people, probably about the same thing, but not necessarily the same aspect. So, it, it's interesting. Good. Next question. Carolyn. So one of the questions that I have that kind of comes to mind just because of past experience, um, Gordon and I have kind of talked off mic about these. How do we create a more proactive relationship with the river keepers as opposed to the reactive side of it? You know, it's that whole idea of we're not doing our jobs because something bad has already happened. Yet if there's flags and signals on it, we may not all be aware of it until it's already a day late and a dollar short. You know, we've kind of run through that same gamut with fisheries management. You know, it's already a problem if we're in an overfish status. Well, we should have been doing something before then. So how do we work with you all to try to stay on the front end of that instead of being on opposite sides of the table to ensure that our conservation measures are all the same? Well, that's a, that's a complex question with a lot of different layers. And, um, <laughs> Did it, was everybody able to hear the question? All right, good. Um, <laughs> short, short question. How do we go from a reactive to a proactive relationship with the river keeper? Join your river keeper group. <laughs> yeah, um, on an individual, 
Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me first state what may be obvious, but I think it's also the truth, and it's important always to tell the truth, is that if you're working for an agency that has a regulatory function where a riverkeeper might take exception to the decision, we can't ever completely avoid the conflict. So we can't, we can't, we can't, if, if you're administering the Marsh Act or, or your colleagues at CRD are administering the Marsh Act, or, or EPD, and I don't know if there's anybody in EPD in the room, but, but no offense, if EPD is making a decision on, um, on a regulatory issue that I take exception to, uh, there, there's, no, there's no way that we're going to completely avoid the conflict. But, but I can tell you how I do it. Um, I have the, 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 a relationship with Jack Cap. I, ha I have Jack on speed dial. He and I talk. Now, I don't like everything Jack does at EPD. I don't like um, maybe 70% of what they do. Um, and I certainly don't like who they do it with in terms of giving more shrift to a regulated industry than they do to the rest of the citizens. But the, that first step is having that relationship, uh, manager to advocate. So I think that's the first layer of it. And I'll take a second layer of it, and then we'll, we'll see if there's third, fourth, and fifth layers that, that y'all are thinking about. I think the second, the second layer of it is let's go ahead and agree on what some of the problems are, and, and you'll have, have those discussions, and not be afraid of the R word, which to me is the restoration word. Um, pre preservation or, or is a is a really interesting concept. Uh, Tanya touched on this. Just keeping things like they are today is no longer acceptable because we have such degraded habitats and flows, etc. So conservation, which to me includes preservation and restoration, has to be balanced between preservation and restoration um, to create resilience in, in communities, in the river systems, etc. Um, and so if we begin to work on some restoration projects together, I think that that can enhance that dialogue and it can also do, do good things for the ecosystem. Um, but we're never going to completely avoid the lawsuits. Um, it is true that river keepers were born to sue. I mean, that, 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 is, that is why we exist. We fill a niche that most other conservation groups are not willing to fill. And if, if, if I, as a river keeper, were perennially, um, um, if I perennially stood in the way of taking legal action against a major polluter that we had tried everything else with, but yet I was, I was unwilling to bring to my board this recommended legal action, I would eventually be fired. That, that's, that's just the truth of it. They, they find somebody else. So, so we can't forget that. Uh, would you like to add something to that? Oh, yeah. uh, so uh, particularly when it comes to EPD, from, from my limited experience as uh, a river keeper, but my experience as a, a researcher before that and dealing with um, and, and staying forth with, with issues, I'd say there's a structural um, issue with EPD. I think they're, they're structured to be uh, reactive instead of proactive. And I think a lot of it comes from uh, their start for staff and funding. They, they don't have the staff or money to do their job, so they're left to be reactionary. And a lot of that you know, comes from just the way they're set up. Sorry. Back to the super secret team. Uh, but in all honesty, I don't know. If, um, I guarantee you every river keeper up here there are multiple people that call them on a regular basis or conversations that nobody really knows about. Um, and I think those conversations are super important. Um, river keepers by nature get calls from everybody from the citizen to the regulator. I'll give you a good example of the local utilities departments. One of the reasons we have such a great relationship is these guys want to do something about the sewers. You know who won't pay for it? The elected officials. So it works really well when there's a big sewer issue that we can highlight it and then all of a sudden it's really easy to get that funding so they can get the repair, right? 
So that relationship is not something we need to tout. I'm not, we don't need to hold hands and walk through the damn legislature together. But we do need to be having conversations constantly. The other thing is, I guarantee you, we know our rivers pretty well. So having a you know, question, are the shad showing up yet? Or have you heard from your fishermen yet? Those kinds of contacts, just brief, are so crucial to keeping those relationships going. Um, and especially if you've worked with any of these guys in their previous lives, keep that up. Because it, it's pretty, you'd be amazed at how often I think either they can give you information that you might need or, or vice versa. And everybody's stronger because of it. Others? Laura? So back to the, how we can start working together. And I'm not really sure that any of us is going to have an answer. I think that uh, it's been mentioned all of us individually in our watersheds are working with uh, some of you all and some of EPD and, and uh, a variety of forms. But today is the day maybe we start, right? Today's the first step in finding ways to work together. And perhaps we could be invited back again. Uh, hopefully you guys will reach out to those of us that maybe presented something you have an interest in or a curiosity in and we can have a separate meeting and start figuring out how could we work on a project like this together? How could we work on your interest together? And how could we find funding to do it? So I just want to second and thank you all for being here today and for inviting us here, because this, I think, is the first step. Um, I think one of the things that I work at continuously all the time and crack on my board anytime I start hearing this is um, we've really got to unpack some of our reactive prejudice um, towards different groups and the fact of the matter is if we get in those trenches there is no way out like if our reaction to some particular regulated entity that we're constantly at odds with is they are the enemy then there is no solution unless it's close them down and if that's not going to happen then there is no productive discourse so i think um whether it's agencies i don't I, would only assume that there might be prejudices in some of the other, you know, kind of parties. But I think for me personally, I'm constantly checking my own reaction to uh, headlines, to emails, to enforcement orders, everything. I'm constantly trying to reset this filter of we want the same things. Um, and genuine, generally, there is a reason why something hasn't gone the way I think that it ought to have. Um, and rather than, you know, getting pissed and, you know, showing it to a whole bunch of people and, uh, you know. False advertising. <laughs> yeah, you know, Facebook posts that are, you know, inaccurate or mischaracterize someone's intentions. Um, I'm constantly, uh, particularly reminding some of the fire breathers on my board, um, you know, we can't, we can't start from that footing. Now, we may end up on that footing, uh, but that's certainly never where you know, in my organization, we start because of that constant lens. Um, so I was just going to add one quick idea here. Is the way I like to think about it is that we're all trying to get to the same goal, right? And we have different tools in our toolbox. Um, there's certain things that regulatory agencies can do. Um, there's certain things that nonprofits can do. And as Gordon said, um, lawsuits is one of the things in the Riverkeeper toolbox. Um, another thing, another <laughs> method that we use is, um, for example, if EPD isn't regulating something the way we think that they should, we try to change that process. Um, and so there's different ways that we can work to these, towards these solutions, but I do try to keep in the back of my mind that we're all working towards the same general goal. There's just different roles that we play. Um, and on that regards too, the relationship is really important in understanding that, that it's not me against you, it's, um, you know, we can still talk and share information where appropriate and get us to those end goals knowing that we're going to play different roles within it. Um, so. so you ask a question, every one of us answers. Um, I, I, I'm not a military veteran, a gay military veteran. I'm a veteran of something much more obscure at the beginnings of the internet. Which is why my first reaction to everything is data and ways to show it so people can understand it. And I think it's part of the answer to your question, okay, what do I mean concretely? Find us volunteers for water quality testing. 
That's the first thing. Are you concerned about fish? Water quality is a big indicator of when you're going to have problems with fish. So that's one thing. As far as legal actions, the reason it took us four years to even get around to applying to be a river keeper is it used to be water keeper reliance pretty much require you to be lit litigating all the time or you'll lose your license. They don't do that anymore largely because they have so many international licensees. And in lots of countries, if you sue, you're going to lose more than just your license. And why was this an issue for us? Because we don't have a coal plant. We don't have a butte. We don't have a rainier on the Altamaha. We don't have most of the obvious kinds of targets for lawsuits. In our case, it's all politics all the time. So we could have sued Lowndes County about those repeated leaks on Valtech Road, but it was more effective to pry the data out of Georgia EPD and post it in public and get them to realize this was going to happen every single time. And I don't know how much effect that is had, but I can say it's more effective than suing them would have been. Good. Great question, Carolyn. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, the, the, the topic of the lawsuit seems to be interesting to everyone. And, and as a new river keeper, it's something that uh, has been asked of me a lot about like our world of lawsuits and, and litigation. And I'd say as an as a environmental advocate organization that I think somebody mentioned that's in our toolbox, without that in our toolbox, we don't really have the power that, that we have. So that's important, but it's, the general public needs to understand that's not our go-to, you know, that that's the last thing we want to do. And if we're in a lawsuit, then chances are we're on the right side of the law and the lawsuit needs to, to be there. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of times we get kind of a, a dirty for dirty reputation for, uh, for pursuing. <laughs> so I just wanted to, to make that sense. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. Flint River Keeper just settled a huge lawsuit with the Tenkata Manufacturing Corporation in Upson County. Um, we did not, we, we spent six years working on that problem before we ever filed the suit. We brought the problem to the manufacturer first. Then we brought the issues to EPD. Then we made comments on a new EPD permit. Then we began collecting detailed, very expensive water quality data so we could bring a Clean Water Act suit. Then we filed a 60-day letter and entered into a negotiation with the polluter. <coughs> then we started moving toward trial, and they realized that we had a data set that was um, of very high quality, and they decided to go into settlement talks with us. So, as Damon indicates, the, the lawsuit should be, in my view, the last thing you do after you try everything else. It's a lot like a divorce. But we have to have that in our toolbox. Yeah, but we have to have that in our toolbox. Yes, sir. What's the process for getting flow policy change? What is the process for getting flow policy change? I'm going to I'm going to take that as in Georgia. Uh, well, the, the DNR board has set the current policy, so the quickest way to get it done would be to get the DNR board to consider it and doing it. So that could that could rise up through the ranks of, of DNR staff. Um, good luck with that. Uh, that's been tried once. Um, I would say that the current sitting DNR board would be less inclined to make that change than the one that that adopted it in the first place. That's just my political estimate. That said, we have a new governor uh, who is of uh, a different political philosophy than the last two governors um, with, with regard to a lot of different things. People in the room may not understand the subtleties of what I'm talking about, but I can, I'd be happy to have an offline conversation about that. It will be interesting to watch the new DNR board appointments as they come up and see who this governor appoints. So that's, that's the quickest way to deal with it. But if you remember Civics 101, we have three branches of government. Um, I, 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 I reckon that a, a sort of an omnibus um, 
multi-river keeper, multiple citizens group lawsuit might be possible. Uh, it would be based on a property rights argument. It would be directed at the department. It would be based on eastern riparian water law. Um, and, and that might be a route. But if the DNR board is going to continue to be recalcitrant about it, the easiest way, and it's not easy, would be to introduce some legislation that would force new water policy on the, you know, from the legislative branch to the executive branch. So none of those are easy pathways. None of the three, um, but th those are the theoretically the three pathways um, of how we would change water policy. Now that said, at Flint Riverkeeper and in other places, we're not waiting on a change in water policy to change the minimum floods. There's a difference between restoration work to change to improve floods, which we're we're engaged in at Flint Riverkeeper with farmers down south and utilities up north. We're already putting water back in the river, so we're not waiting on the policy change to put water back in the river. So anybody else want to tackle that one? <laughs> that was great, okay. Gordon. Great question. Mike? Gordon, do you think that the general public has a real good understanding of the problems that low flows cause uh, the question was, do I think the general public has a real good understanding of the problems that low flows cause? I would say no. I would say the general fishing public that doesn't exclusively fish in ponds and reservoirs has a good understanding of it. And the paddling public, which is growing by leaps and bounds as, as a water sport these days, they have some conception of it. But the general public has no clue about what what sorts of problems low flows are causing uh, in the rivers impact, and in their local economies. If that impact is in their backyard, if it, if it uh, doors their ox, uh, then perhaps it might make the whole job a little bit easier. So I guess my point is, in the first step in solving the problem to, to get the message out to people in some form or fashion that, serious problem with your hot I, I think that's true. And I think we're hamstrung by having to divide our energies and time with, with regard to the, all the different issues that are in our watersheds where we can't focus on just that one. Now at Flint Riverkeeper, we focus on that one a lot because it is our biggest problem on the Flint. But, but each Riverkeeper has to focus on the problems that are the most burning ones on their plate. Yeah, I just had a comment. So uh, the, the, the River Network is another nonprofit um, that, that works around um, water, water, water issues, and, and they're, they're, they're seem to be doing a pretty good job of trying to get that out in the public. And um, I think they're kind of gearing up to, to do a campaign. Maybe somebody else could uh, elaborate. So there is an educational role that everybody in the room can play on that issue. Yes, ma'am. Um, so in a watershed without a designated river keeper, how do you build a relationship with your river and your community and to begin to deal with impaired waters? To, in a watershed without a river keeper or any other sort of group, how do you build a re relationships in the community to begin to deal with impaired waters? <laughs> That's a great question. It usually takes a train wreck to get a river keeper started. <laughs> That's usually what happens, so I'm just going to let y'all answer that. <laughs> so, um, I guess I'm, I'm lucky enough that I get to serve on the Waterkeeper Council. Um, so the, the answer is that if you're interested in becoming a Riverkeeper, the first thing you have to do is actually apply to become one. But uh, again, it gets back to bush beer. Um, I'm not kidding, but it really is like the cheap beer is the cornerstone of river work. Uh, but it's been, it means you know, going and just hanging out at boat ramps, going to show up at your local commission meetings, just getting to know people. It takes a lot of time. Getting in the top of the watershed in a boat and floating down or living in one spot for 15 days. Make sure people know you're doing it though. Um, but things like that where all of a sudden it, it takes a little bit of audacity for you to say, all right, I'm going to be in charge of this now, or I'm going to speak for this river system. But if you just take the time to talk to people, they want to talk to you. 
Um, just sit back and relax. In Georgia, it takes a long time to hear stories, but um, that's where you start, just personal relationships and build those personal relationships. And before you know it, people will start calling you and they're asking you about all kinds of crazy things that you then have to try and research 15 minutes before you call them back. But um, just build relationships is, is number one. I would say that you're lucky that we're in Georgia and there is not a square foot of uh, Georgia that's not covered by a river keeper. There is. There is. is. Yeah, there is. Yeah, two rivers. Two. Look at you speak I just have such a big one. I thought yeah, it was yeah. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, If you're talking about the Blockney, uh, there is a group called the Blockney River Water Trail, Margaret Tyson, talk to her. Also, talk to other uh, river keepers. The mother of Walls Watershed Coalition, I said this wrong last time, the mother of Walls Watershed Coalition, Coalition is Helen Rogers, the literal mother of Gordon Rogers, because she's who connected the people at Tifton to the people in, in uh, People in Tenth County to people in Lowndes County that formed the nucleus of Walls. We now have board members from other areas, but you know, talk. You know, these people sitting here probably know some of the people you need to know in your watershed. So there's another one. And never forget to heavily exploit a good disaster. True. <laughs> Um, so, in the Flint, uh, what got it going was the second time that high government officials proposed to dam the upper Flint and inundate all that shoal bass habitat and mountain habitat. That got people rip roaring mad um, from, uh, from Gay, Georgia, all the way down to Bainbridge. And so, never forget to exploit a good political or natural disaster. So we're out of time, and again, Carolyn and other people on the executive committee, we really appreciate what what y'all did to get us here. And uh, I think we got to have a little meeting about the triennial review right after that, right after this. But then we'd love to uh, mix and mingle and socialize with y'all in the bar and at supper and, and other places. So thank you again very much.